Michael Chen. <laughs> hey, Jazzy Bell girl. Ooh, ooh. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> oh my God. Let me just say, my ooh, ooh has been rusty. You know you my friend if you know my ooh, ooh. I mean, you can hear it across the road. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> you know what else is great? You and everything that you have been doing. So first and foremost, let me just say congratulations on everything. Thank you, Fran. Thank you. <laughs> you are so welcome. Like I said in the introduction, you are executive producer over at Lifetime Network. And you also executive produce the Clark Sisters movie that yes. we love. That I'm so folks glad. I know that broke records. So first of all, talk to me just about that film and, and that journey and how that's been for you. What's been amazing about the Clark sisters is that this was a story internally that most people didn't know. And I remember when Dr. Holly Carter, who is the executive producer that brought it to Lifetime, brought it. And then she brought Mary J and Queen and Missy. And that got everybody at work's attention. Like, wait, who are these ladies? And I was like, Hi, they are the best singers in the world. They have changed my life. They've changed millions and millions of people's lives with their otherworldly voices. And to be able to be a part of bringing that story to the world and to do it and support Black women telling stories about Black women for Black women has been like one of the greatest joys in my life. I mean, we had a Black woman directed from Detroit. We had Black women writers. We had you know, Black women executive producers, the top six people on the call sheet were Black women, our head of hair, our head of makeup, our script supervisor, the list goes on and on of Black women that were just so invested in making sure that we told the story of these icons right. And I mean, the proof is in the pudding. You see it in the movie, what happens when you support authentic filmmaking. So to be able to do that was, I mean, it's so bomb and I'm so honored. Listen, 13 million viewers when it airs, so you're doing your thing. And I thank you just as a black woman for amplifying our voices. So we appreciate you for that. Now, yeah. you just said that um, at first he came across your, your co-worker's desk and you was, were you initially put on as executive producer or it took for you to show that you were well-versed in the Clark sisters and they said, you know what, let's, let's give it to them. Can you explain? <laughs> yeah, so it came, I, I have only been in LA for about a year. Um, but before that, I was working out of the Lifetime New York office. And so most of the like most of the high profile movies come through the LA office because that's where the talent is. That's who comes into the office. And so when they came in, there was a white coworker of mine who took the pitch and she, you know, was not well versed in the Clark sisters. That's just not her ministry. That's not her thing. She don't know. And so during the development process, she was having a difficult time, you know, trying to figure out the individual stories, the individual lanes of all these women. And they kind of felt similar. And she was voicing those frustrations and concerns in a meeting. And <laughs> it really upset me the way that she talked about them. And it really upset me that this was not going to be told as authentically as it should. And so I went to my boss and said, I really want to be on this project. And she goes, well, if this executive wants you on the project with her, then sure. So I went to her. She was like, I need your notes. I wrote up that night four and a half pages of notes about the script that we had so far. She showed them to the producers and the producers like, yeah, him. We want him. So that I kind of bullied my way onto this project because I wanted to make sure that it was done right because you only get one chance. I mean, people don't realize that this is the first biopic about gospel artists. This is the first one ever. And so you gotta make sure that you come out the gate correct and you gotta come out strong. And I wanted to make sure that we did that. And so that, that's how I got on this project and I, I never let it go. I was like, ah! <laughs> Listen, they say when you got your opportunity, take, take your shot. And you also show how diversity is so important. Yeah. So important. And you also show that ain't nothing wrong with being a bully here and there. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, sometimes you got to be <laughs> a little direct and forward to make sure that you get what you want and to get what the art needs. Mm -hmm. And there's a way to do it where you're not nasty. I wasn't nasty. I wasn't rude. I didn't call out her name. I didn't talk shit about her. I said, hey, this is a deficiency you have. Here's where I can make sure that you don't have that anymore. Here we are. Let's do this together. And I mean, I learned some great things from her about storytelling, about, you know, building a world. But 
I brought the authenticity. I grew up in black church. I grew up listening to these women. I knew who they were. I had their I had their um, unsung saved on my YouTube playlist because I would watch it over and over again because it was just so good. I'd been to their concerts. I knew who they were and I had to make sure that they were respected in the way that we told their story. And especially that Dr. Maddie got the props that she deserved, that she wasn't just some bully, some mean woman that threw shoes and yelled at people. She didn't do that. She was just caring for her kids and she wanted her kids to be the best mm. and and that's what I wanted to do and Anjanu brought it and did it. Can we talk about Anjanu and the casting process? I mean because as an executive producer I hear that title thrown around very uh, mm -hmm. loosely lately you know mm -hmm. and I feel like mm -hmm. it's one of those titles that a lot of people don't quite know what it all entails. It's like, are you on set holding the camera? Like I have an executive producer in my family. I'm, sometimes I say ignorant shit. I'm like, are you like holding a camera? Or are you like, <laughs> so, <laughs> and he's like, no, sis, no. So I would like for you to kind of explain, cause I know you just said it a second ago, how you were very instrumental in the script process. Is that normal? Mm -hmm. And on top of that, what, would you say the executive producer for you all in terms of your job? Yeah, so there are a couple of different types of executive producers, particularly on this movie. Okay. So I was the network executive producer. So I represented the network, I represented the money, I represented you know, the, the lifetime's interest in this project. But then we had executive producers like Queen, Mary, Missy, Laretha Jones, who doesn't get enough props for this movie, and Dr. Holly Carter, who were the creative agents behind this. Mm -hmm. And we had to make sure that everything got done. We had to make sure that the casting was right. We approved everybody that got hired on this movie. My job was to make sure that it still, while we made a good movie, that it fit into Lifetime's brand and what it is that we needed it to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, and as the Lifetime executive producer, we had final say because we were paying for it. So made sure like we had final approval over everything that happened. Um, and so we were involved in everything from looking at wigs to looking at, um, to looking at lights, to looking at like, how do the shapewear look on these ladies? Like, I don't want to see lumpy, dumpy big girls on screen. Mm. And we had an amazing woman from Toronto who was our wardrobe designer, who was this French Canadian white woman mm -hmm. who took such care to make sure that these women looked flawless every time they stepped on screen. Mm -hmm. They had the right girdles, they had the right bras, they had the right clothes. They would buy everything and then she would tailor it to their bodies. Mm -hmm. Every time you see one of them go across the screen, someone hand sewed that to make sure that it fit them right, including Anjanou. So like, we were in it to win it. We were in all the details to make sure that it all happened right. So um, needless to say, the executive producer runs the whole show. Everything. Yes. Everything. That's what we do. That's so what we do. when it comes to Arjun, who was amazing, and um, I hate that you guys got snubbed for the Emmy, but that's another interview, another time, okay? Ooh, <laughs> you know, my feelings are hurt, and I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> Deservedly so. And maybe we can tap into that later, but let's just talk about her amazing performance and the casting yeah. um, the process of that. Was she a shoe-in? Was she something that y'all sought out? And if I want you to add on to, was the, did the family have any say so in the casting process? So Dr. Holly represented the family's interests. So she would talk to them. She would make sure that they were okay. But what I learned is that, you know, I think she was she was so busy that they didn't get to really be as involved as they want as they probably wanted to because we were moving so fast. Mm -hmm. um, but they were so happy. Like Auntie Jackie Clark is like my new favorite human. She brilliant. And if you ever want to talk to someone good, go go slide in her DM. She will bless you with a good word. Mm -hmm. But she said that they didn't. She didn't know who who Angela was before Angela got cast. Who played her? But she said when she sat down to talk to her. She was like, that was nothing but God because she was the perfect person to play me. Mm -hmm. So, um, but Anjanou, um, she actually, like, being very honest, was not our first choice. And <clears throat> she, you know, there was another actress that wasn't available. 
And then our casting director, Twinkie Bird, said, I think Anjanou Ellis will be perfect. And I was like, oh. And we were all like, Anjanou, yes. Loretha Jones called her because um, she has a personal relationship with her. And Anjanou was like, mm, I'm not really looking for a project right now. And they're like, it's to play Maddie Moss Clark in the Clark Sisters. And she said, wait a minute. Hold up. And she talked to her family and she said that her family really wanted her to do it. And so between her family and her wanting to honor these women, she signed on to do the movie and blew everybody away. She came up and like took these actresses that played her daughters, most of whom had, besides Raven Goodwin, this was everybody's first movie. Mm -hmm. So no one had done anything before and she made sure that they had what they needed to succeed. She's brilliant. She's mm -hmm. an amazing artist. Watching her work, being on set and watching her do what she does is a master class. Mm -hmm. And if like, I feel so lucky that I got to be like up close and personal and watch her drop in, watch how she crafted these performances and did it take after take after take. She's a G. She's mm. a G. Shout out to Ajinu. Shout out to Twinkie Bird. Can't wait to get her on the show mm -hmm. as well. What did he say for um, yes. stepping in and making the right call? Can you tell us who was the first one in mind? Can, <laughs> can you spill that tea for me, Michael? I probably, I probably shouldn't. I probably shouldn't. But we got the right person. So it doesn't matter who they were because we got the right one. That part. Good answer. <laughs> well, speaking of this, um, Film, can you tell me what was your most memorable moment on set? What was your most favorite moment? When they did the Name It, Claim It performance, mm. it was one that I fought really hard to have in the movie. Me and Dr. Holly were like, this is the clip that's on YouTube that everybody looks at, like classic Clark sister performances mm. of them in those like flowy gowns and just singing Name It, Claim It. Yeah. And at the beginning of the movie, we had 31 songs. We had 31 songs in the movie, so we were slicing and dicing musical numbers. Yeah. And this was one that had been sliced. Yeah. And I was like, we have to have this moment in there. And we got it. And so to show up on set to see them in those robes, in with that hair, and when the lights went and they were singing live every tape. Mm -hmm. And so to hear them start with that, just, 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 like they, chills i mean i was running around video village i was so excited and just crying and i was like this is gonna be good because mm. they slayed that mm, it was more than favorite good. moment it was favorite more moment. good it was amazing also um chan just so i could tap into your journey because with inside hollywood i want to really inspire people to go after their dreams and we had a conversation mm -hmm. um not too long ago and you told me something where it's like you know we all have our ups and downs and our obstacles that we try to overcome can you just tap in and talk to me about your journey and and, and getting here to be able to executive produce such an amazing show like the clark sisters yeah um that was, that was a great time getting to talk to you um, about that. <laughs> yeah. um, but 10 years ago, I had just finished, 10 years ago, like pretty much today, I had just stopped sleeping on the train and I had just stopped sleeping on park benches and my friend's couches because I had no home. I had no money, I had no job and I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and I had trained to be an actor. I moved to New York to be an actor. I auditioned, did some things. Um, but then I met Twinkie Bird. She was actually my first boss. I made my way into the notorious uh, casting to play Biggie Smalls. And she told me I was too cute and too country to be Biggie. Um, and I was like, well, I could be less country. She was like, no, thank you. Um, but she let me intern for her. And I interned and I eventually worked so that she couldn't feel like she could do the job without me. And I was her assistant for two and a half years. But then I didn't want to move to LA. And I, money ran out and I was sleeping on the train. And I had to figure out what I was going to do. And I almost left. I ended up getting a job with Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. And um, I traveled the world with them for four years. And so I realized like this was supposed to be a gig. This is not what I wanted to do, but I got to keep going. 
and then God will always tap you and then knock on you and then bust your head into a fucking wall until you listen. And we found two people on tour dead within a week and they died. One had a brain aneurysm and one I think died of a broken heart. That's what I believe. And they loved what they did. They loved touring. They loved dance. I didn't. And if I dropped dead on that tour, I knew it wouldn't be, I wouldn't be fulfilled. And so I knew I had to get about the business of doing what it is that I wanted to do. And that was film and television. So again, I quit my job. I had no job. I moved home to Texas and I just started calling everybody I knew that worked in film and television, LA, New York. And I was really trying to find a way to get back in the business. And it was hard. And my mom was like, you need to start applying for jobs at Target because you need to be making some money. And that broke me. Mm -hmm. And I ended up having a conversation with a woman at Lifetime. Her name was Megan Hooper White. And she took a chance on me. I called her. We had a, you know, we played phone tag for three months. <laughs> I finally had a conversation with her. Didn't think shit of it because I was like, she didn't want to talk to me for three months. What's she going to say now? And you know what her ass said? She said, I have a job that opened up on my team today. Would you apply for it? And I applied for the job and I got it. And it was like the bottom of the barrel job. I was, all I did was schedule for people, do people's expenses and watch movies that they wanted us to buy. Mm. And slowly, bit by bit, I started finagling my way onto creative stuff. And I started moving towards the originals team and showing them that I was interested and showing them that I wanted to do it. I would do notes on other people's projects and ask them if they would want to hear them. I would, you know, stay late and watch cuts and make sure that like I knew what everybody's projects were. I read everybody's scripts. I knew what was going on in the business. I knew what was going on at Lifetime. And she slowly started letting me do more and more. And then I finally moved off of the team that I was on and solely onto original content mm. and just worked my way up to having my own slate of movies. And they ended up transferring me out to LA and I got promoted. I moved from a cubicle to my own office. I got an office of blackness and um, have my own slate of really dope projects that I'm, I'm really excited about. Oh my God. Thank you for sharing that story, Michael. When I tell you when we talked um, about that, I was teary-eyed then and I'm teary-eyed now, but mostly I'm inspired. So continue to do what it is that you do because you're definitely an inspiration to me and I'm sure many, many other people out there. Now you say you do have some other projects that you can't wait to do. And with the Clark sisters, is there any other, you know, stories that you want to amplify as well? Any other voices out there? Because you're doing it with the sisters for sure. What else? Yeah. You and what's what's dope about Lifetime is that we are a network that's geared towards women. And so um, I'm really interested in really pushing the boundaries of what that means. And so I like, I, I want to work on projects about Black trans women. Um, I've got something in the works about that. I want to work with uh, more stories about Black women and women of size. Because, you know, fat women need their stories told too. We're out here, big people. And, you know, in, in TV, you don't really get to see them. And that's what was so dope about the Clark sisters, is that we got to really explore that. And um, I'm really excited about that one. And... Um, what else? I mean, I've got like 20 projects, so I'm trying to think of which ones I can actually talk about. Mm -hmm. um, huh. Not a lot that I could talk about just yet, okay. but there's a lot of exciting stuff coming, some more music biopics, some Ooh. more rip from the headlines, like the Kamaya Mobley story that um, I did at the beginning of the year with Niecy Nash and Robin Roberts. Mm -hmm. um, which Clark Sisters was number one, Kamaya was number two. Exactly. Just saying. Yeah. Um, black women are out here <laughs> getting their stories told. Um, and black women are like making those stories. So that's yes. what I'm about. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that's my, the, you know, that's really important for me to make sure that we are telling auth stories authentically. Mm -hmm. And to be able to do that, you have to hire people that have lived experience that match what you're putting on the screen. It's so important. The fact that we had all of these women in like headscarves and rollers <laughs> and, you know, they were wearing the right undergarments. Like that's important. 
you know, and we wouldn't have, probably wouldn't have had that if there were no black people behind the scenes making sure that things happen. Well, listen, this is my confessional hour. I have a couple of minutes left with you. I'm just going to ask mm-hmm. quick questions and then you yep. really weren't like one word answers for the most part. Dope. So tell me, growing up, what was your favorite television show growing up? Oof, Living Single. Living Single, favorite character on there? Maxine Shaw, Attorney of Law. <laughs> easy. <laughs> so easy. Um, what's the biggest lesson learned so far? In life? Yes. You are always exactly where you're supposed to be. Don't compare your journey to anybody else's because you are exactly where God has put you. Yes. Okay. Who is one talent that you would love to work with when it's all said and done? Ooh, when it's all said and done, I really, hmm. yeah, I'm going to say it. I really, really, really want to work with Viola Davis. I think that she is one of the most brilliant minds and talents of our generation. And to work with her and Jennifer Lewis, maybe at the same time, would be a dream come true. How would Michael Chen like to be remembered? I want to be remembered as a good friend, someone that spread love everywhere that he went, and left a legacy that his parents could be proud of. And listen, I appreciate you being here inside Hollywood with me. Again, you are inspiration. Yes. I really enjoyed this interview. I can't wait to chop it up and put it together and let the world know more about Michael Chan. <laughs> I'm so glad I got to be here with the Jazzy Bell. Like, I feel so special. Thank you, friend. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Thank you. Continue to inspire. Continue doing great work. And I'll talk to you soon, okay? All right, sis. <laughs> Bye. Bye.